absolutely out of here. Let me just check my microphone out. <laughs> well, I'm afraid to say the microphone got completely blasted by the wind and it's almost unusable, unusable there. I've got to get myself sorted out with sound systems. When it's windy, it's just a, a no-go. But there you can see, a really nice day, but unfortunately, it's one of those sort of high-pressure days on the change. A little bit of stormy, cloudy weather around, and uh, those clouds obviously draw the wind as well. I'm just across from Limington Marina there, and that's what they call Limington Seawall, which goes... Oh, long way round, all the way uh, round to, I think it's Hearst Castle, I've never walked down that far. But there's a channel comes through there, which I've always, in my mind, had um, a feeling that the fish do run through there. They come out of the Limington River and into that. Across to the Isle of Wight, however, in the Solent, as you can see, is just a load of white water. And a lot of people don't realise the Solent, with a wind against tide set situation, can get pretty rough, cut up pretty rough in there. It's, a lot of people have been caught out. So although the island itself looks very close, I'm not sure what this guy's doing, he's going nowhere far. So I feel he might have found one of the sandbanks over there. I think that might be what they call, is that luffed up? Luffed up. I think that's when something happens with the sails, I don't know. Who can tell us? Further back in the creek, that's standing looking to the north on the opposite side of the Isle of Wight, you can just see a lighter colour to the left of that white boy, of clear water and that might be the place to drop a, a bait. It's seen clear there. I'm going to be using here grip net at the bottom which I don't really need there but it's only a I think a three ounce one and ragworm bait tipped with strips of squid. So all you do for beginners again you know that's all we're really interested in as beginners keep your bait well I don't need to keep it cool it is cool but put it in a bag and keep changing the paper so it doesn't uh, get all juiced up because normally they say a dead ragworm will kill the others I mean let's base it basically we're putting a hook through them so that's going to kill them and if that doesn't kill them the fish that eats them will kill them so they are going a means to an end without bait on the hook you will generally catch nothing so take the fat end the head end thread it round first I just inside the, what I call the uh, the mouth or jaws it roll it around the bend of the hook sometimes if it's a very dry hook you'll find until you've had a worm or two on there, it's a bit tough feeding them around. But make sure you pop, just grip it really tight with your thumb and forefinger and pop it over the eye of the hook. And then I feed as much as I can up because if you are casting any sort of power, if you leave the tail out there, it does tend to snap off anyway, which is a sort of pointless exercise. I could put a whole squid head on there if I wanted to, or I could snip off just a tentacle. Not the long catching tentacles, but just the short, I'm going to call them grabbing tentacles that that species has. And that's ideal. It just tips off the bait so they've got the chance of... And there's some luminous beads. Let's not forget the little luminous beads there. Small hooks, I think, for beginners, honestly, people, is the way to go to catch something. All I'm using is a spinning rod here, lighter rods, and just lobbing it out because I don't want to go past that channel onto what I call the weeded sort of flats. I don't want to go so short that I end up wrapping it around that woman's head that was walking along the foreshore there, but I'm high enough up. There is a the famous shotgun holder, which is a piece of sink waste pipe duct taped onto the bottom of the holder. And the fun rod is that little spinning rod. So very often I have caught fish on that when I've not had anything on the distance casting rods. So set up on a beautiful but windy day. Some of this will have to be voiceover. I'm down here on the south coast. I'm trying to grab an afternoon stroke evening, coinciding with high water at about, I think, 7.38 this evening. Just trying to catch anything. I've no idea whether they do get smooth hounds here. I don't know at all, so it's all uh, sort of a bit new. I've got two, I suppose, two or three inch lengths chunks of squid out there, up here. Now you might be able to see, I don't know if you'll see it with this camera, there's light patches there which I originally thought were weed but I think it's just sand there because I know when I fished it before the current rips around here on the so I've got basically two big baits and cases of smooth hound I don't know if they get smooth hound in this shallow water maybe over high I don't know but generally they say that smooth hounds like quiet conditions they don't like it to howling and blowing that's what I'm told anyway you can actually see a line of clouds over there where it's raining and I've noticed this quite a bit look see the line on them there's a name to those clouds I can't think of what they are 
Um, but you can see the tide's gradually going to fill in in front of me here, and as it fills in, up goes the chance. I've got small hooks um, and small rods, just because I figured I don't need to cast far, not big fish here, and obviously I've got the wind behind me, that'll give me a few extra yards as well. So basically it's a sort of sit down on this embankment and wait for the tide to come in. Now then, I'm going to stick with the, uh, with, with the uh, voice over here because the microphone, uh, as I say, I've only got to go inches outside that umbrella. And as you can see there, there is the seawall with grass there, but unfortunately, I guess it's made of concrete. So it's a very uh, thin surface of grass to put, um, say, rub rests in or, or, or umbrella stakes and stuff like that. But at least the wind is coming off my back there, which for those who want to know is sort of southwesterly. There's my rig, which is one down and two up, as they say. And all I'm doing is just lobbing it out. And I'm not powering it as far as I can because I found, having been there before, that a lot of the fish come in this clearer channel, especially on an ebb tide. If you go too far, I tend to go onto weed and I don't know whether there's more crabs there or what. I also stop the lead. If you saw that, that jerking motion was stopping the lead before it hits the water because if it's shallow at low tide, you'll drive your lead into the mud and then it gets stuck. So the reason I do that stopping motion is in shallow water like estuaries, um, what we call flats areas, because I don't want the lead burying. Just kill the speed of the lead slightly before it hits the water. You can see that channel there, absolutely clear. It's a wide angle, so it's obviously a lot wider than it looks on the camera. On the back of me, however, there is a sort of lagoon area. So anybody likes bird watching, you get lots of different migratory birds there as well. So I just stopped it there. If you saw the jerk, I killed the cast with my finger on the reel just before it, the lead impacts the water. It's just a little tip if you're casting into shallow water. Goodness me, that is some rainstorm that's going up probably on the inside of the new forest. Just a lob out and then just stop it there. Just kill the impact of the lead going into shallow water. As you get to higher water, not so important, but if you've got, let's say, two feet of water, the power of the lead will drive through and go into the mud. Oh, out of the wind, thank goodness for that. I've not only lost a brolly a few times. Of course, I'm using just fixed balls because it's fast, it's easy, it's simple. I used to use multipliers all the time to get more distance, but now, you know, the modern fixed ball reels are the way to go. And I just can't be bothered unpicking birds' nests from multiplier reels all the time. It just wastes my fishing time and is frustrating and annoying as well. I'm going to have to hang on to this brolly and that black cloud is getting closer, unfortunately for me. Come on, let's see a little... That's what I want to see, a nice rattly type of bite. So I'm sort of tucked under the umbrella here. I've no idea what the sound's coming out like. Probably this mic's awful because it's straight directional. So as soon as it goes across the uh, wind, it's... Hopefully you get a bit of it anyway. No bites yet. Give it till four o'clock, I'll wind in and see if I've got bare hooks. And I think I will have from the crabs here. This is not a lot of tidal flow here, but I'm hoping no weeds. That's my theory. Out on the main channel, well, they're, all the anglers are moaning about the amount of weed on the beaches and you just can't fish, you get broken off, you get big clogged up bits balling along the beach sideways laterally with the, with the tide, bangs into your line, jams up on what they call the leader knot and that pulls your bait out of position, generally into the guy down tide of you, or worse, into the breakwaters or groins. There's nothing worse than a tangle in your groins. I'm feeling a blank coming. I felt that before I left home this morning, it all went wrong, it didn't come out right. That is Armageddon over there inland. That's got to have thunder and lightning in that. I'm hoping it's going to go along the inside here, the last one. Over there you won't quite see in the distance. That started as one of those, went right across the Solent there and took three and a half hours to get from there, from here to there. Come on, one fish. I've started to go put a few more worms on now. The crabs are going through everything in 15 minutes flat. The tides well up, you can see down here. It's coming up now. 
supposed to have about two hours before high water if that hour and a half I just hope the last time I caught was in the winter was ebbing so I've got to hang on so that means a really late night before we get home no home in time for tea well I've had a couple of little bites well good bites you know what small bass are like bang 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 and then gone it's unfortunate the hook might be a bit too big for the size of um, I'm imagining it's a bass anyway annoying to say the least it would be nice just to come out with one fish anything black cloud coming so I'm tucked under here try and get something to eat because I'm going to hang on if I can I think it's around about high tide I think it's about high water but if I don't get anything and it does feel like the proverbial blank I will see if I've got any bait left over and I'm sort of wondering in my mind I've got a lake in mind that I did well on um, about a week or ten days ago just an afternoon session now the thing is with the sea you don't know where the fish are they could be half a mile that way they could be two miles that way they could be five miles that way it's an ocean and that's why it is a challenge in a lake way easier they're in the lake they're not going anywhere are they they might still not feed of course you gotta find them but you know they're in the lake i don't know if the fish are here in front of me do i that's my problem that's the challenge with all sea fishing and that's why sea fishermen go sea fishing so what i might do is stop off there see if i can get a not today on the way for another job and uh, see if i can't i'm watching this at the same time see if i can't catch anything on tiny strips of squid if i've got any left over little bits of ragworm i did try it once before with lugworm i can't remember the corner thing or not but it might be worth a try i've got to salvage you guys something somewhere along the line but it's not over yet but i think it's high water and once that pulls the other way if i don't get the fish then i'm not going to get them at all all i get is weed you're very close to a cook up at the moment the bonus I've got to look at this is I'm not getting weeded out I'm getting blasted out this has been pulled out of this stake a couple of times by the wind and if it gets under it it's gone <laughs> it's going to the the Isle of Wight the umbrella and anything's tied to it <clears throat> what I uh, it does sort of concern me and I don't mean this as a gripe but definitely the sea fishing in the UK the south coast particularly to me along the Soden area, seems to have gone downhill for what I call the resident fish. God, listen to it. For the resident fish. Now, listen, we know we get big fish. We get loads of smooth hounds come through, but they come through. Then we get stingrays that come in here, giant stingrays, but they're, tra they're transients, they're travelling. They're not living here all the time, are they? What seems to be missing are the species that are living here all the time. Place, flounders. They get bass around it, certainly do get bass, but not like high average, I'm going to say high average, not nursery bass there. Eh? And then the rockling and all the weird little species you might get. You know, other ones, black bream, sole, somebody told me they're, they're getting harder and harder to catch now. And I do wonder if it is all the pollution that man's putting in through the rivers and in the industrial areas that wash off and the shipping areas that Southampton Portsmouth, Gospel, add all those high intensity population density of boats up in there. I wonder, has anybody taken samples of the mud, like a core, like a core drill they do in ice, you know, and just seen what is down there and how much the pollution levels are? And is that what killing off the ecosystems? And that's why we haven't got the small fish. Answers on a postcard. Well, the sun's going to go in in a minute. There's a big cloud coming right up wind of me. So I guess, together that one over there, if the two meet up, we all know where they're going to meet up. That's right. Right over my head.
at long last, at long last, at long last. There we go, guys. Just before the rainstorm, people. I did say I had two real banging bites, and that's what they are. Let's turn that round. Little small, what do you call them? Checker bass, that's what we call them. Little wee chappy like that. Well, that's right, I would guess, on the top of the tide. So I'll get him back and get this one straight back out there again. Save the plank. Just. Even these little ones like this have got uh, spikes on them. Let's get him back. Oh, gone. Great. I'm all keen again now. Might just be a little bit before the uh, tide turns. Watch the fish hooks, yeah. Out. Out. Well, I'm huddled under here. As you can see, the rain has arrived. I just had a bite in that middle rod, actually the top one as you look at it there. It's a little checker bass tapped away in it. Then I had a real blow up with a line, or a line blow up. I've had it before when you cast, trying to cast really hard and the braid fluffs, just whew, can't get through the rings. I think what it is, my rings are for multiplier fishing, they're not big ones to cone the line down with a fixed ball when you cast hard. Most of the time I'm just doing a regular heave ho um, and, it, and it works okay, but anything I try and cast harder, you can't, uh, I don't know, I guess shut that line down quick enough. I think the sort of line comes off and it overtakes itself. So I've cut it off, started again. Don't need a shock lead, I'll just tie straight on. Tiny little bite, and I'm using small pieces of worms now. And a little tiny little thumbnail, a sizey little thumbnail, just tipping off the squid. But um, I think the tide has turned, so it could be all over by the shouting. Three bites, one check of bass. Not great, is it? I'm still fishing big baits over on the right there. I just hope this weather goes through. As you can see behind me, it's all, it's about 10 miles long and it's all pointing right over my head. We bring Mike's carp barrow here. That was a very good idea because I figured it's all flat and I've done my neck in, I've done top of my back of my neck in. So I do not want to be carrying great big humongous strap things, which I normally do. Another thing, when you're coming down, I'm going down this concrete bit. When this black area, any rocks are supplies to, when that gets wet, it is lethal. And I don't mean wet from the sea, because it might be a neap tide, it's small, it might not come up that far. If it's black or green, any colour, algae on it, weed on it, if it rains, it's lethal. Take my word for it, be very, very, very careful. Many a time I've been rock fishing, I've had to take my shoes off and, and go up on my socks. So, uh, here's one I prepared earlier. It's beef ravioli in a juicy tomato sauce. It's one of your five a day. How could you eat five of these a day? Well, I did prepare it earlier. I had to go to the supermarket. In we go. It's gone quiet, guys. Not looking good again. It's a weird, weird day. It's got to be these pressure changes. I've got to blame something. The thing is, I say, spank bowl cooks quicker. Uh, ravioli's got, obviously, the meat inside. The little sachet bits, pasta sachets. It does take longer to get the heat through um, into the meat. So don't cook it too hot too quick. Look who's talking. Look who's talking. No wind. Please, no wind. There we go. Nobody can ever say there's... Uh, 
a chance of me dying of starvation. Mind you, <laughs> I would be if I had to live on the fish I catch. I'd be better off just eating the ragworm, I think. Ragworm and ravioli. It's got a sort of ring to it. Ring, ringworm, probably. Come on, fish man, give me a break. I just want to see one hammer over and stay over. It's so tough, the UK sea fishing can be really quite grim. South coast, I'm talking. If you go somewhere like Devon, Cornwall, north coast of Somerset, Welsh coastline, it's a different ball game. But the general, I call it estuary type fishing along the south coast, it's not, it's not great. It's not what it was when I was a kid for sure, what it is. That's a Teflon melting. So we've got some action going. Yeah, that's sticking nicely on none stick. Right, all looking good people. In we go. I know as people say, use a wooden spoon in there, Graham. If that doesn't look delicious enough, just lightly sprinkle, well, quite a lot of cheese on there actually. Then just put back on to warm again. I'm not cooking in the uh, in the pan, I'm just warming it up, that cheese, just melting it a little bit. Well, it's just melted that cheese in there. And of course now, it's warm enough to put on my lap and dry me off a bit. The wife's given me one of these. These are rarity. That's one of her uh, home baked rolls. But what you need is you have to take out a sort of unlimited liability on public or private dentistry treatment because she bakes them so like if you want a broken tooth, this is a kitty to have. I don't know what she does with them. She loves her baking, unfortunately. Oh, down my neck again. Because I'm sitting around the wrong way to uh, actually see the bites. There we go. That's what it looks like. Mm. Better turn around in case. No, nothing's going to happen tonight. Well folks, I think that's it, I'm going to call it quits. Nothing but nothing has happened. The ravioli went down and stayed down, which is good news, but you can see the setting I've got here. Really nice, but no fish. Oh, I'm going to say cheerio for now, but don't leave the channel just yet, because I am determined to take these baits and try squid and ragworm in one of my local uh, day to get freshwater places and just see if we can't salvage something. So it's one checker bass and a lot of driving. Guys, we'll see you in a short while. Oh, oh no, oh no. I've got to come over here, I'm poised like a cat. Oh, the other one as well, oh no. Missed that one. Oh my god.
Is that this one on the right? Is that weed or is it a giant stingray? That's going to be weed. That was a bite on both of those and I just baited them up. Well, that is bizarre. If I just literally was packing up, left the camera running, and the fish have probably stripped. They're tiny bass. I think that's all they are. Little short, small checker bass. And they're just, together with the crabs, are stripping it off. I think they're so small I'd need a carp hook or something like that, a small carp hook. Just packing up, just about to wind up, and those bites that you saw people were indeed slightly bigger this one. I'm calling them checker bass. I'll take it, so it's two bass. Hmm, maybe I won't be uh, using those in the fresh water. I feel I've got to have one more throw out while I pack everything up and get this guy back. Well, after my struggle on the shore, and I've got a bit of squid and worm, and I'm doing really well with the rud. Wait for this. I've only got one left. Squid tentacles. They don't seem to like the actual main body section, which you would use sea fishing, which would be good. They don't seem to like that too much. Whether it's too hard or not, I don't know. But you can get a good, off of one head, about six or eight sections of the tentacles, and they're just about small worm size, if I can describe it. I'm fishing it very shallow. So I'm using antenna float, top and bottom. And I've got it maybe a foot or so deep. A little bit of ground bait. And for some reason, the rud, is it, it, they're taking it within the first two feet. I might have to go a little bit deeper. But I've had a couple of fish before I even uh, bothered switching the camera on. A lot faster than that shore trip. And I've got a feeling there's other stuff out there as well. I've got them going with a little bit of ground bait. Just to, just to sort of bring them around into the swim. Now I want to film one for the camera. Oh, I miss it, I missed it. Guys, this is how close I was. <laughs> Nearly. Swim is about four feet deep. Slightly coloured water, which is good. And I feel I might have a chance of a bream as well. Outside chance for carp on squid tentacle. Pretty well, let's face it, can't beat anything. I've just got to keep the bait going in. At least this way, you know you can go freshwater fishing and you can use... Oh, missed it. Man, how did I miss that? I'm going to go deeper. Well, I've got good fish on, on the squid uh, tentacle flies. I don't think it's a car, but I really don't know what it is. It's a bream. Oh, I've got seven hooks now. Wrapped up. Tell you what, it's a lot easier than that bass fishing, isn't that? Because as I say, you know that in the lake, you just got to hope they're feeding. Good result. On again. And, ooh, look at the size of this rug, people, look. That is really nice fish. Squid tentacles.
the wind's coming up and it's uh, I'm finally running out of squid tentacles. But I have had quite a few bream, rud, and that one carp. But I'm getting dragged to the side now, it's getting a bit noisy with the people for filming. So, moved on for catching those couple of little mini bass. Hard work, but listen, by making the change, going from fresh water, sea, sea, fresh water, trout, whatever, shore, boat, I end up catching a few fish, scratching something out, and that's why I've always been all round angler. I like all round fishing, keeps you fresh. We'll see you guys in the uh, next episode, hopefully. Nearly, nearly, nearly the float's going. Ledger's gone pretty dead now, I don't know why. But uh, I need to get home and have something to eat. It's been a long day. We'll see you next time. Hopefully, a few more fish. Oh, I say, I say cheerio, and uh, I'm actually hooked up to another one. This is almost a... A swinging skimmer bream, I think. Ooh, just missed him. I'm on the wrong side of the camera for this, but you guys can still see it, look. Skimmer bream, bit of sea bait, hasn't been wasted. Do you know what? I think I shall have to do this again. I'm fighting desperately, desperately trying not to turn that awful plastic dial. Some of you might have digital buttons. The thermostat, the dreaded word, the thermostat. It's finally getting colder. Oh, I hate it in winter. Six months of fun and freezing. Lovely. Log burner, non-stop. Anyway, I've got coming through now, after that little fishing clip for you, loads and loads and loads of clips. I finally finished this last weekend, what I think that's most of what I call my random section production file. I've got loads of random stuff for you. All going to tack it on, just give you guys something to watch. I even found, it was in a two terabyte file somewhere from years ago, Mike, when he was young, talking about gilly cattle. It's in there, but the information is still pertinent. Anyway, sit back, relax, there's another section coming, it's the world famous, well it's not famous, I've only had one film up on it. It is going to be more coming called the random section. So guys, I've got a new discovery for you, something of a new discovery. If you remember, I fished at St Michael's Lake. <clears throat> a lot of you enjoyed uh, watching the films there. It was a secluded little gem. Well, here's possibly another little gem. And with me is Mike Oxman. Mike uh, ran the St Michael's Lake, and it was a you know, real little favourite place of mine. But there's a new one. It's in Somerset. So Mike, tell us a bit about this one. Well, I took this over in April, and then I opened it to the public in June. Um, it's approximately one and a half acres, uh, predominantly carp at the moment. There are a few tench, a lot of rud. I'm hoping to do a stocking program uh, as and when I get some finance. And uh, it's on a day ticket. It's a, a £10 day ticket. And it's uh, just a lovely place in the countryside to come and fish. You, what I said when we first got here, I was just saying, blimey, you know, I've just been covering a ploughing so uh, competition, so it's obviously pretty noisy. But here, I'm saying nothing. I can't hear a chainsaw, a motorbike, a jet, a plane, nothing. So it's very similar to the other place you have. So it's what you're, what you're coming for almost. Yes, it's fish, but a bit of peace and solitude. And that's what it's about. But there'd be no night fishing, I imagine, would there? Yes, there'd be night fishing. Oh, there will be night fishing, yeah. Yes. Yes. I'll walk us around it, tell us about the depths and that as we go. Yes, it is. Let's the, walk down this way. So I'll just come in, we're about in the middle of the yes, lake at the we're moment. We're going down through pegs one to nine now. Uh, uh, quite a favourite with my, the anglers that come here. The margins are sort of two to three feet for yep. about five feet out from the bank. And then it drops out to about eight feet in, in the middle. So it would be clay based lake, looking at the colour, it must come off the hills yes, of it's water. clay. Uh, the margins are, are gravel. Uh, gravel. I've, once the water went down in, uh, when we had that dry spell, I cleared all the branches and twigs out so it's, you've got nice clean margins to fish to. And uh, at the moment, uh, I, I personally don't know 
too much about the stocks of the lake. So it's but, almost unknown quantity for people yes. fishing it. So uh, if they want a bit of uh, unknown fishing, this could be it. Th that's it. Uh, a few tench are starting to come out now, which I'm very, very pleased about. Yeah. And uh, yes, there's um, many, uh, lots of big head of carp in. You don't very often catch a small one. Smallest I've probably seen is around about three pounds. And uh, up to date, the record at the moment that's come out since June is fifteen pounds. Oh, it's a big fish. So it could be a bigger carp than that. I dare say yeah. it will be, won't there? Be could bigger be, ones. Yeah. Oh, let's we'll have a walk around as we as we go here, right? And then what time on a day ticket would it be starting at the moment? Dawn to dusk. Fishing. Oh, really? So yeah. And, and uh, you got parking there, haven't you? The parking where we parked down yeah. the bottom. Yes, there is parking down the bottom, and there's a toilet in the car park. Out in the middle here, sort of just got an island there, haven't you? So in the middle here would be what sort of depth it's there? Seven to eight feet. Uh, so you could float fish it? Sorry? Float fish that sort of depth, could you? Yes, yes, float fishing. Uh, at the end of the lake we're coming up to is where the water comes in to feed the lake. That's your inflow, yeah? Yeah, there's a big silt bar, which is very shallow on the end, but the carp love cruising around it. I bet they do, yeah, yeah. So, uh, and of course, any food washes down there, I suppose it's a little yeah. food trap form as well. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, there's 20 pegs on the lake, so there's always plenty of scope if somebody wants to hire it for a day for a... Exclusive. For a, for a match, for yeah, an exclusive or, match. Yeah. Or, or a private fishing with a few friends. Yes. Almost, yeah. No problem. And then fishing up to peg one is a start, I see up here. So that, that's a sort of jungle area, you can't walk all the way around it? No, not up this side, no. See, I'm looking in here already, mate. <laughs> it's just a corner that looks fishy. And this this will clear up, you say, in a couple of days. This yeah. is because we've had a load of heavy rain in the Somerset Hill, so it, yeah. it whistles down there. Yeah, it looks very fishy down there. This is one of the rare times when I actually gone to see a water and I haven't bought a fishing rod or bait. I bet this. I bet there's some in the summer through there. Yes, they uh, they like the margins. I do. I like the peace and quiet. Is a thing. Will you sort of promote float fishing close in, or will you have to trim some of these for casting? It's not really a need to cast anywhere, really, it's is it? It's not really a need to cast a, an underarm yeah. catapult cast. Just to get it out there. It's fine. Um, when you fish it yourself. You find what a rod length out, just sort of standard length out. Rod length out, or if I find a clear one where I can cast, I might have a heavy waggler and fish the centre. Yes, yeah. yeah but um, not very often. And to be fair, I don't fish it very often. I like watching other people fish. You like watching them catch the fish, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So bait-wise, any restrictions? Anything? No. You ban this, ban that. You know what things no, are. No. Is it pretty flexible? Pretty flexible. Uh, same rules as most fisheries. Barbless hooks. Yeah. Um, I would suggest a you know sort of five pounds straight through. Yeah. Yeah, because it's a. Uh, there's... Well, some fish there's no need to go light, and if you've got fish to fifteen pounds in there, you just <laughs> yeah, don't want to lose them. That's right. It's um, it's a bit of fun. Uh, I had a guy here last week. He. He had a session from 8 o'clock until about 1.30 he fished and he had eight commons, one mirror and a four pound tench. Oh, plenty. Oh, nice tench then. Yeah, yeah nice so, tench, uh, yeah. He was quite pleased. What baits would you suggest if people want to he come? Was, you he know? was using... Um, Lunch of meat uh, maggots. Strawberry pop-ups. Oh, pop-ups, yes, yeah, yeah. Off, yeah. off the bottom, so whether... That's a, that's a good way to go to keep it up off the bottom, out, out of the silt. Out of the silt, if this drops out, guys, you can see yeah. that. But well, two days this will start clearing, you reckon? Two or three days, yeah. The sun, you'll see it once the sun and the rain stops. You'll see the colour gradually dropping out of it. Well, that's where the overflow, I almost call it the dam end, but you can see that. I can hear it, actually. You can hear the water running out, so there's plenty of water here. two pipes in here it'll it'll only go down to that level there's two six inch pipes. oh i see it running now right you see it yeah i've got two six inch pipes and i can control the water from there now there's features there and it's actually where it's fallen it's shot up like um like the hazel when they make the fencing isn't it it's coming yeah. back up again <laughs> it's growing vertically
This is one of the favourite pegs. Uh, this one and number 12 and number 13. Yeah, this pool end looks nice, doesn't it? Yeah. An inviting fishy pool for people. Yeah, that's uh, that's about four or five feet in there now. Yeah. And then it goes to a up, up to a margin, up to about a foot deep, in, right on the edge. Over oh, there. really? It's a bit of an edge there. Yeah. And it's a like a drops down. And pegs all the way down here, right? Yeah. 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 So you've done a lot of maintenance here. Is this what it was like on the left there? All the way, yes. All the way was like a jungle, because yeah. I know how well you maintain that at Michael's Lake. So. Yeah. yeah, well, the grass is just coming back now. This would be nice for next spring, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah. That gives you an idea of it there, people, anyway. Prevailing wind, I assume, coming off your back here somewhere, and it's windy today for sure. So being a small lake, you can find your way around and find a, a spot with the wind off your back. Or well, if you're getting a bit cold, find somewhere with the sun. Uh, when you had it in the summer, you've, you've only had it that early, say springtime and summer, it wasn't this colour, it was clear. It's clear. So, so yeah. you, you're, you, what you're saying is, well, because it's I a seasonal it's... ploughing, you think that's what's yeah, your so, straight and, soil. And the heavy rain, and, and yeah. the heavy rain washes the silt down out of the, out, off the hillside. So once they start planting and the crops root, if they do have heavy rain, it's just going to be clean water going in yeah. rather than yes. ploughed field water. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. it now. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So all this sort of stuff you've had to cut a channel through. Yeah, yeah. This is the shallow end of the lake. Uh, central of, of the end is a silt bar with a, with a stream coming in. The stream feed the, the water level, so... So this is another lake, is it, right? Like or, or a little pool? It's a, oh, little... It's a little pool. Yeah. Strip with a stream to your right that feeds it, comes down from the other lake. Oh, this is literally from the outflow then. Yes. Yeah. No, no, as you can see to the right, I've got a lot of work to do. I want to clear the stream to, to the right. Yeah. And uh, I'm hoping, uh, but maybe because it, it flows when when it's uh, going nicely, and I might put a few little brownies in there. Yeah, yeah, because they like that bit of calm, wouldn't they? Uh, I was looking at some bullheads and. Uh, where, where does this actually run into? Or the ditch as such, the actual waterway? Just that pond, and that's it into my lake then it goes over a dam the far end yeah and goes down the stream down the valley gotcha but you can see like the the gravel on the bottom there we said part of the lake had a sort of gravel yeah. base it's about two, it's, it's very shallow but it's it's fishable i fished it with a tiny little rod and caught a few rod and roach and hook size you say maximum 14. 14. Oh, so baits would be just like loose fed maggots or something yeah, like that single maggot and you can see the general valley back down through there, guys. That's see the shape of the hills up here. Yeah. Either side, you can see the valley. This looks like the hot swim. It's been fished before, as you see. <laughs> no, no, it's where, where I've chopped it out. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. It's about, two, it's, it's very shallow, but it's, uh, it's fishable. I fished it with a tiny little rod and caught a few rod and roach and hook size you say maximum 14 14 oh, so baits will be just like loose fed maggots or something yeah, like that single maggot and... you can see the general valley back down through there guys that's see the shape of the hills up here yeah. either side you can see the valley this looks like the hot swim it's been fished before as you see <laughs> no no it's where I've, where I've chopped it out oh really yeah, yeah. I'll finish, I'll finish here without sun's out. Well, there you go, people. Might be worth contacting uh, our Mike, and even if you didn't want to fish it during the winter, keep in touch. Check it out. You never know what's going to come out of a water like this. Now, how are they going to get in touch with you? You're going to. I'll put your phone number in the link. That's what you normally do. Link in the description. Yes, uh, I, I, I think I sent, uh, sent you that. Yeah, I haven't looked at it. If you, if you sent it like email, yeah. I haven't looked at those yet. Yeah. I only did my text. I sent you a poster. All yeah, all you said that. I saw it here yeah. and then thought, oh, no, well, yeah. I've got no post I'm going to put this up for that wind. All the rules are on, yeah. on, the, on the poster. That's better. Are you stand in the sun there? Come forward a bit. It's only for, for the mic, that's all. Yeah. And you, uh, you book it through me. Just ring the number uh, on the... Uh, 
A link in the description. We'll put a link in the description to Mike's Lake here. Yes. Yeah, called that. Love Lynch Lake, Mike. That's what it's you call it. It's called Love Lynch Lake. So I'm just uh, interested to see the colour drop out of this and I can get the impression, as uh, Mike was saying, because the fields have been cropped when I'm doing this, we're talking the uh, autumn, the fields are just, they're ploughed up, ready for the next lot of planting. So any rain that runs on to the land surrounding is going to run straight in at that colour. So in the springtime, it'll be a lot clearer because the roots will hold all the compacted soil together. It's finally arrived. The end of the line for one much repaired, broken, sellotaped, bolted, screwed, support stainless bracket. Famous, famous, world famous, totally awesome fishing chair, fishing line. It has just snapped beyond belief. Even I can't bodge that up anymore. It's had it. It's knackered. I said to Mike, get me another deck chair, but it's got to be the same colour. <laughs> what he did get me was interested. So this one, 40 years I should think I've had that at least. Goodness me, I've seen some fish. But Mike had some Land Rover, some antique Land Rover stuff delivered, and the gentleman gave him a couple of these. Original fighting Land Rover chairs. And they're pretty lightweight, so look, what do you think of that? It's so old, look, it's got the original cross-cut screws there. Can you see that? Just regular cuts, all bolt holes, original canvas by the look of it. So really nice chair. This one will take place of my old friend. I like it. Oh, do you know what? I think it's higher than that one. That might be better. We give it a go, I can always change it, can't it? It's green. So the fish won't see it, will they? You've got to love that camo green. My goodness me, I don't know how people catch fish without it. Oh yeah, you can catch fish with a nice bright chair. They're not bothered what colour the chair is. A, you're sitting in it, and B, they live in the water and we live on the land. Right, that's that. New chair, look out for it in one of the future programmes. Something else I'm doing while I'm in here is I'm collecting some seeds. We had some really good wildflower seeds this year. Once I bought down local supermarket, Brilliant, really good, going to do them next year, but I've been on recommendation from other gardeners collecting the seed heads. I've got some which are large poppies, which I kept from another property. I just show the heads, so anybody wants to do it, there's some free seeds going if you want to go out there and collect them yourself. What they do is come up on the stem like that, but once they've been growing and they start to die off and fall over and they get the angle, not when they're so much straight like this or these have been dried, you probably can't see, but on the end, just very carefully, they start to open up a bit. Got earwig in that one. So when you turn the upside down, generally, look, it's like gunpowder. Absolutely gazillions of them. If they've already turned over upside down, the seeds are all over your garden, look. But look how many come out. But they don't actually let the seeds out until they turn right over the other way. You can, I can crack that one, I should think. Let you have a look inside, it's all interesting stuff. Free seeds, I love it. Look, plenty in there, plenty. Now I can scatter those around and then they themselves will self-seed next year. Just be aware there's millions, of seed. look at that lot coming out. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of seeds there. Some will take, some won't. And I've done it with all the other the seed heads we've got, and some I'm still drying off, you know, a little bit damp, that's a slightly damp one. You, know, you don't want to come out quite so much. But there's enough seeds there to keep anybody, that's a nice dry one. There. Tip that one open. Look how many seeds I've got. Ooh, now that's too young. If you, can, you can see that one there, that's finito. There's a few in there. Not many, you want the dried ones. So all I'm going to do is put those in a drum envelope, keep them in a dry place, keep them in a the house somewhere sort of dry, cool. You put them in the garage if you want, must not get damp. And I can sprinkle those around next year and I've got some free lovely pink poppy heads. The other thing I've got is a few of you might remember um, a sketch with what's called two comedians, called two runnies. And it's involved one of these. 
the gentleman went into a shop, and as a previous shopkeeper, I realised the man wanted four candles. He wanted some four candles. So the man gave him four candles. No, he didn't want that. He wanted four candles. Four candles. Does anybody remember four candles? This one I've pulled off. I've got to plane it all down and salvage it with this. Obviously, the wood glue didn't. It didn't work. The wood glue wouldn't work on plastic, would it, you stupid child, Graham? Another job to do. Four candles. Who remembers it? Four candles. Get these seeds before somebody sneezes. So we're looking at sealants here, guys. So you're looking at OB1. Hybrid sealant and adhesive. Leaky gutter. Yep. Play the sealant. There's the hole. You see that, guys? Leaks no more. You don't need to smooth it off with a thumb or anything yeah. like that? It's done. And um, what's the manufacturing behind that? Is that English, American, Chinese? It's a, uh, we're, we're a UK based company, but our man manufacturing plants are all over yeah. Europe. So uh, we're, uh, this, this is manufactured from Holland. Yeah. So it is, uh, and as I say, we have multiple uh, points of manufacturing all over, all over the world. And I've got here stuffy sticks as well. Isn't yeah. it? You've, got a, you've got this brick kit. And if you look at this brick here, the small surface area, high bond. That's the same stuff or same, another? Same stuff. Exact same stuff. So you can use it on woods, you can use it on acrylics, you can use it on mirrors, you can use it in soft plastics, you can use it on tiles, copper, marble, lead, felt, PVC, UPVC, and polycarbonate. So absolutely. I'm standing a bit back in case the handle yeah. goes and my toes run underneath never, it. Never gonna go. Really? Never gonna go. So as you see, you have one product yeah. that replaces seven or eight different types of. Exactly. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. So something different there for you people out there, and that's what it's called. And one assumes you sell this through Screw Fix. Yes, yes. You do. Yeah. Yeah. So look in the Screw Fix shops, and uh, you pick up something different. How long has this product been yeah. out? This product was launched in uh, July 2019. Uh, the concept was launched in July 2019, yeah. and it was launched into the market in January 2020. And what a time that was to launch any product! Yeah, uh, not good, was it? Yeah. Now, one thing I get: putting a nail or the cap over the end when you got some left. Okay. Any tips for guys on that? You know. What I would say to people is: okay, the, the screw into the top of it's fine, right? Yeah. But well, this product here is what they call a hybrid system, hybrid polymer, right? When you open that cartridge, right, if you keep the nozzle on it, that will stay alive for about four months. It's not going to choke up in here? It, it will choke up in yeah. here. Obviously, it's yeah. going to cure here. Yeah, that's it. But it won't go down into the cartridge. Okay, so right? you're not going to, sometimes you have that much left, yeah. and it goes to rubber. I'm talking no. a bathroom sealant yeah. type You thing. won't have that problem with this, right? Yeah. A wee tip for people. That's right? what they want, tips, yeah. A wee tip. When you're using any type of sealant, if you want to create an airtight seal, yeah. if, you, if you're really conscious of it, you can do two things, right? There are little caps that you can buy, I think Screwfix actually have them, where you can put them over the top of that. So you're saying take this off the yeah, top and put with the nozzle and put a sealant cap on it. Yeah. Or you can do it the old DIY way, is get yourself a little bit of clean film. Clean film, I thought it was coming, yeah. Put it over yeah. and just close it. Yeah. As soon as you said that, I thought, why have I spent all those years yeah. trying to unchoke these? No. Yeah, That's the way you unscrew it, yeah, it's a seal the top. So it is. So, but with this product here, 24 shelf, 24 months shelf life unopened. Yeah. Once it's open. Once it's open, you, you still have four months, five months of it. Oh, yeah, it's good, yeah. So there's no very little waste there. I oh, appreciate that. Very Something different. Thank you very yeah. much for that. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. I've recently, in my LRF videos, been using one of these. Now it looks a lot bigger than the uh, the flask here. It's actually pretty much the same size. It's called a ghillie kettle and they come in roughly three different sizes. And the way it works is, it's quite a cool little contraption really. So it, it pops off here. This is this is your, your kind of base bowl. And in here, as you can see, it's all burnt to black. That's because that's where you put all your twigs, uh, your lead, dried leaves and things like that. You light them up, then this is the kettle there you can see it's a big hole in the front it's like a funnel that sits on top and then under here in that hole there that's where you pour your water and that goes around the outside of the actual funnel so it's a, it's a quite clever invention really so the heat will come up flames occasionally will come up through here so 
that's heating all the outside of this and it's actually boiling your water and that's basically how the kettle works. It's quite a clever contraption. It's not, I don't use it just for cups of tea and things like that. I use it for quite a few other things. But before we get started doing this, and, and me showing you how to use it, let's just show you a couple of tips on starting that flame. Now, before you can light your fire, obviously you're gonna go, you have to go out there and collect sticks, bits of twigs, dried leaves, things like that. Emphasis on dry, you must use dried stuff. If I show you these here, it's recently rained today. These are pretty dark looking sticks. I've, I've snapped these up earlier for the camera. These probably wouldn't use really, they're a bit wet. Whereas these, are a lot drier. Okay, I've had these undercover, I've kept these dry overnight. These are much drier, these will burn a lot better. Just basic fire stuff, really. So I've gone and collected a load of sticks here, purely because when you start the ghillie kettle, you need to have all your sticks ready. It's just like any fire, really. If you start a fire and you don't have enough sticks, you've then got to go and collect the, fire, the sticks, the fire might go out. So I know this isn't a huge fire, but you need to have your sticks ready. It just saves you going out there halfway through while you're fishing you've got to stop fishing and then go out and get all the sticks so collect all your sticks beforehand you can even put your sticks in a little resealable bag you can dry them out overnight and come in to take them to your fishing session just a little bag of twigs and sticks and things like that um, what I've got here is this is probably what I'll start with using these really fine thin dry twigs there's some dried leaves there as well that's probably what I'll start with and then I've just graded them really so I've gone up to a bit thicker there so as the flames start to build up I'll start putting those ones on and then we'll finish up on a little bit thicker there and then when the fire's really going well and you've got a good bed of ash going we'll go on to the that's probably the limit I would use for a ghillie kettle I wouldn't go any thicker than that there's only a small pan that it's in you can also use and I, what I found is useful are uh, small pine cones actually time there's a time of season when they fall off the trees obviously but if you can collect the pine cones they burn really well so let's get this fire going and I'll give you a couple of tips on starting that fire. Right now, being an outdoors person, I like to start fires the proper way, and that would involve things like a fire starter and uh, some tinder and things like that. But purely for the video, I'm just gonna use a lighter and some cotton wool. Cotton wool's really good for getting those, the fire started. It's almost better than newspaper, really, because the flame takes hold a lot quicker. So a lot of the time you'll think, oh, cotton wool, I'll just burn it, you know, straight up like this. Don't do that, here's a tip. If you peel it, they tend to have two layers. If you peel it open, there's lots of this fluffy stuff inside. Now that's the stuff that the tinder almost that really can get going. So just fluff it up a bit like that. And that's the, that's the stuff that you're gonna light. Now I'll place those really light twigs that I've got, those dry twigs, uh, and I'll start off with them and then I'll build up layers to get it going. So I'm just gonna get a couple of these, fluff them up a bit. These are on the, the base layer, as it is of this um, gilly kettle. Just fluff them up. I've got a couple here. These are great if you just keep them in your uh, fishing, your tackle box, things like that. Um, you can use ma you can use matches or a lighter. Obviously, it doesn't matter. Just like I say, for the sake of the video, I'm just going to use a lighter. And I'm just placing these around the, the whole base of this uh, pan here. The reason why I'm, I'm trying to cover the whole area is because I want that fire to have a, a strong base. If you do it all in the middle, the outsides won't heat up. And it just means that when it comes to getting that that fire going later, it makes it a bit difficult to keep it going. So I try and cover the whole bottom of that pan. So the last one here, fluff it up a bit. You don't have to do it too much. So there's my bed layer of, uh, of tinder, if you want to call it. Then I'm going to get these really thin dry twigs. And I'm just going to put a couple in. I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it because the flames need to take hold, so I'll just put a few in to start with. And then I'll build that up as that flame gets bigger. Now before I light it guys, just a couple of basic safety things. Fire is dangerous, obviously it's not something that sh you should, you know, mess around with really. Do take it seriously. If you're at a fishery or something like that, maybe ask, because it is, it's an open flame, uh, but it's not you know on the ground as such it is kept in a bowl but it's still an open flame so it might be worth asking your fishery or wherever you're fishing just permission to say that you will be using a, a ghillie kettle so i've got my uh little bit of cotton wool and dry twigs in there this is the hole in this base because when that kettle goes on that's how the oxygen gets in to keep those flames going uh, and 
often when it's going and it, it's burning out, you have to blow into that hole to give it more oxygen just to keep those flames going. So what I've done is I've stuck a bit of cotton wool out there and that's the bit I'll light. It's not the world's most amazing lighter. You won't see the flame very well probably on the camera. But as that burns through, you just want to be careful with it blowing out because you don't want that. You want some of the twigs to, to, to take hold first. So that cotton wool, as you can see, I'm not going to put any more twigs on just yet because that's not, they're not even a light yet, so there's no point. So just let that build up. I'm waiting for the flames to come across to the middle as well. I can see some of the twigs are starting to light now. Now these twigs obviously burn quickly. So we're just letting it get round now. As you can see those flames are getting bigger. I'm still not going to put any on just yet. Okay, flames are getting slowly bigger. I'll put a few on this side now. Always make sure that when you when you start to do it to begin with, you do want those dry twigs. See now that flame's gone a bit. I'll let that pick up. Right, so while that's burning down now, just getting that base layer, I'm gonna put the water in here. Obviously, like I said, they come in three sizes. Uh, I think there's a half litre, a litre, and a litre and a half. I think I've just gone for the litre one. This is just a carrying handle for when it does get hot, because this whole metal bit does get hot. Obviously at the moment, nothing in it. So we've got the water, just in a little container here. Fill it right up. You don't want to, you know, scrounge, go scrounging with this one. Just fill it right up. As I say, it takes a good litre of water, this. So it's going to take most of that... Uh, you don't want to overfill it as well, that's the other thing, because if it goes spills out and goes in the fire, it's going to put your fire out. So that's about right. Water's just on the edge there. Then this, uh, the, the sort of whistle bit is connected to a chain so you can't fall off. This chain is so that, obviously, if you grab that, that's going to burn you, because that's going to be hot. So that's what this chain is for. You can just pop it off like that, and you can the chain acts as a pouring thing as well, so you can pour the water like that. So we'll pop that on. I can see the fire is getting going now, so we'll pop this on the fire. And then this funnel, this is where the funnel starts to work. The oxygen comes through that hole that's at the bottom in the base. You can blow in more oxygen to boost it, and that flame comes out. And then all you've got to do is just put the twigs in at the top. Easy. Right, so we've got it going now. We've put the kettle on the base. And now all you have to do, as you can see, it's kind of like a chimney, really. It's got that funnel. You're just watching your hands, not burning hands. You can drop your sticks in there let them burn away. If the flame comes up too high, just leave it for a bit, let it burn down, and you just pop your sticks in. And that, the benefit of that wide hole there is that does actually fit pine cones, and pine cones are a good long look. They burn really well, dried pine cones, so you can just put those there. Remember, only use sticks really that are off the floor. Don't, don't snap off sticks on fresh trees and things like that, because A, it's gonna be sort of green wood and it's not gonna burn very well, and B, it's not very environmentally friendly, so just pick the, the dead wood, the stuff that snaps really easily. As you can see, I've got the hole here, just blasting some oxygen into it. As you can hear that deep, as you start to hear that deep roaring noise, that tends to be that it's lighted, it's, uh, the flame's going well, and you can put some more, um, sticks in it then so each time you refill the kettle put some more sticks in it and then give it a blow down here and that boosts the flame that's going well now and then we can have not just a cup of tea but I use this for hot water bottles uh, soup boiling water for um, pasta things like that you know you've got a liter or a liter and a half of water in there that's a sub quite a substantial amount of water so you can use it for quite a few things really now as I was saying earlier about the uh, the green sort of green wood green sticks picking it off snapping it fresh off a tree it's not gonna burn well you can tell if a stick gonna burn well is that if you snap it if it's a nice clean snap that's gonna be genuinely a good stick to burn so if I look at this one so that's a nice clean snap there's no green in it that's gonna burn quite well, so we'll put that in there. I know that's a good stick. Now the see, you can see the seam starting to come out. Here's the whistling. 
That is now ready for a cup of tea. So you've got the wooden handle here. Just lift it off the flames, be aware of the flames underneath. This chain shouldn't be too hot. You can rest it on the grass. Just pop that off there. Put your cup of tea ready. And then it's a case of holding this chain. It's quite clever, really. So you hold the uh, back of the chain, careful of the lid, because that's going to be hot. And I can just pour it. Oh, there you go. Just lifting that chain. And then that is ready for a cup of tea, hot water bottle, you name it. Anything to do with boiling water, a bit of pasta, that's all set. The other thing you can use the flame of the giddy kettle for is some marshmallows. Now these aren't full size marshmallows, these are just those little cake ones, but you guys should be able to get the gist of it. And you can use um, those kebab sticks and just spike the marshmallow on the end of the kebab stick. But being an outdoors person and a camper, I like to go the old fashioned way and just whittle down a bit of the uh, end of a, a twig or a bit of stick really. Um, obviously when you're whittling always make sure the knife's the blade's away from you. Kids, if you've never done this before, I highly suggest doing it with an adult. Obviously you can, if you've got a bigger knife, use a bigger knife. This is just a pen knife. No mate, that's not a knife. This is a knife. So as you can see I've whittled that bit, I've, I've taken the bark off that. Obviously I've made it ridiculously thin because I'm using marshmallows the size of a piece of sweet corn. You go cart fishing with these, well you can actually. Pop up. But yeah they are pop up, pop up marshmallow. So I've gone for, I've whittled it off. Now it's important if you're going to do it with a stick, something I learnt from uh, D of E is that uh, a way of telling whether a, a stick is poisonous or not is you actually lick the, the the whittled area. So if you give it a lick, then you die and I eat the marshmallows. Right? That tastes like wood. If it tastes bitter, like a lemon, and you're like oh, like that, that's actually poisonous. And it's probably not best to use that stick, especially if you're cooking meat and things like that, because the poison then goes onto the thing that you're cooking, you then get poisoned. So just a little test, really, I guess. Once you've whittled that bark off, give it a lick. If it tastes like wood and it's okay and it's not bitter, then you're okay to put your marshmallows on. I'm, I'm gonna make a kebab style here as they're so pathetically small. Not exactly gonna fill my stomach up, but maybe a few of them will. And like I say, you've got that flame with the gilly kettle. Why not make use of it? Not only can you have a cup of tea, but you can cook marshmallows as well. So there we go. Got a few marshmallows on there. Now you can hold it over the funnel if you get the flame going properly, which I haven't at the moment, but the flame can come right up here and you can hold it over the flame there. If not, you can also use the hole where you blow oxygen in around the side, wherever that is. Can't actually see it on the camera. Down here and you can hold it around the hole if there's flames coming out there. But I prefer, I'm gonna put a few more sticks in here now, get flame going and then roast, cook these marshmallows on the top. Right, look at that. That's how hot it is, look how quick those marshmallows pretty much roasted. It doesn't look hot because there's no flame, but they are pretty much cooked marshmallows. Let them cool off a bit. And benefit being, if you've got lots of mosquitoes, especially you carp anglers, we know what it's like, grab some grass. If you put it in there, watch it smoke. And that, if I just get that twig out of the way, that smoke should hopefully help put off some of those mosquitoes. Obviously don't put too much in. Again, if you've got dried grass or anything like that it goes a bit better but you just get that smokiness in there and that helps get rid of those mosquitoes just one final tip safety tip really when you're finished with it just use the leftover water and gently pour over the remnants of your fire to put it all out and that way if you're bibbied up carping or uh, out on the beach you can safely know that your fire is put out and won't be a hazard Hmm, I wonder which one I'll keep. Hmm, that one I'd say. Ah, slight problem guys. Probably should have told you this at the beginning of the video. When you're using these metal bases here of the ghillie kettle, obviously it gets hot. You must put some steel uh, plate or concrete or a bit of metal underneath, otherwise this happens. Mummy! Mummy! I'm telling on Mike! She's not going to be happy with that. I think I'm going to keep this knife, Dad. I'll see you later, yeah? OK, mate. Best of luck. Oh, I tell you what, I could do that Kelly cap to fill my water bottle up. 
I suppose sooner or later the thermostat's going to have to go on. I've had a little tweak. I put it on for, I think it was 17 minutes, just to check the radiators work. I'm sure some of you are out there, like me as well. Don't turn it on if you can help it. Anyway, we'll see you in the next one. Fishing films, and I'm going to try and crank these random productions out, starting probably about, about 1st November. We're going to bung a few up now anyway. See you next time. Thanks for watching, and stay safe out there.